I'm not sure I'll be successful at that, especially if you indulged in the wine in there, but uh, I'll give it a try. So I'm Don Cohn. I am a member of the Financial Policy Committee at the Bank of England, uh, and I'm at Brookings Institution as well, and I'll be talking about stress tests and how we use them at the Bank of England and the Financial Policy Committee. And I guess I should do the disclaimer thing. These are my views and not necessarily those of the other members of the Financial Policy Committee. So uh, simultaneous transparent stress tests are one of the most important innovations and reforms to come out of the global financial crisis. I think they're one of the most important innovations of the 21st century, but up there with iPhones and things, but anyhow, at least they're the most important to come out of the crisis. They're designed to deal with, this, with a serious issue that plagued economies in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, the tendency for banking systems to make recessions worse by tightening credit availability when adverse shocks hit the economy. Stress tests inform supervisory judgments about whether banks have enough capital to continue to intermediate and lend even as GDP falls and losses mount. The tests are done concurrently on banking institutions using the same scenario, facilitating systemic judgments and cross-bank comparisons. They are forward-looking, testing bank portfolios against risks that might occur in the future, and they are transparent, affecting judgments of market participants as well as bank management and regulators. In addition, post-crisis post stress testing integrated economics and supervision in a way that in my, uh, in my experience hadn't been done before. Marrying the modeling expertise and macroeconomic perspective of economists with the deep knowledge of individual banks and banking of supervisors. When the Fed undertook the first such stress test in the depths of the financial crisis in early 2009, we put an economist and a supervisor jointly in charge of those stress tests. Seeing those two people and their teams working so well together and the two of them joined at the hip in their nightly visits to my office to report roadblocks and progress gave me hope that we could make this experiment work. And I think this conference will further develop that critical working partnership between economists and supervisors. In the UK, the stress tests are jointly run by the Financial Policy Committee, which has the macro prudential mandate and is tilted towards economists, and the Prudential Regulatory Committee, which has the micro prudential responsibility and is dominated by supervisors and people with experience in individual firms. Stress tests play a major role in the deliberations of the Financial Policy Committee in meeting our legislative mandates to identify risks to financial stability and take steps to build resilience to those risks. Building the scenario each year requires us and our PRC colleagues to identify risks and assess how they've changed over the year. Stress tests show us whether the banking system has enough capital to withstand the crystallization of the risks embodied in the scenario and other risks as well. So I thought it might be useful for you, a room full of researchers, to hear what I, a macroprudential policymaker, want from the banking system stress tests. And th this is my only slide, so uh, you can stare at that and mark off how the sections go. So the first thing I want is guidance for the setting of the countercyclical capital buffer. The CCYB was conceived and designated to counter the pro-cyclical tendencies of risk-based capital models to call for less capital when times are good and loans are performing and call for more capital after adverse shocks hit. Indeed, the better the good times, the greater the potential setback in bad times. The CCYB should increase capital on the upswing in the financial cycles. A well-designed stress test built on scenarios geared to those economic and financial cycles will help us make sure enough capital is accumulated on the upside 
that it can be safely released to absorb losses and support lending after a shock hits. The stress test should also support that release of the capital circle capital buffer. They should show that as risks crystallize and losses are absorbed, less capital will be needed for potential future losses. I will also address another goal that I have for stress tests, which is to improve market discipline on bank risk taking and banks' abilities to understand and manage their own risks. And key to that is transparency, I think. Finally, I'll take advantage of this opportunity to highlight some areas for you to, dis for you to focus on that I believe policymakers will find useful and uh, several of these areas are already being addressed at this conference. <clears throat> so let's start with stress test and, and raising the countercyclical capital buffer. The Financial Policy Committee recently raised the resting place for its standard time CCYB to the region of 2%. An important motivation for this decision was a review of the 2004-2007 period that raised questions in our minds about whether stress test results and committee judgment would have prompted us to raise the CCYB high enough, fast enough, to avoid a severe credit tightening and taxpayer support that occurred when bank viability was threatened in the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. Bank staff estimated that a CCYB in the range of three and a half to five would have been required before the global financial crisis. Their analysis suggests that that would have been enough to give the banking system capital, enough capital to absorb the losses that followed and leave viable banks that would be able to continue accessing markets and making loans on reasonable terms to credit worthy UK businesses and households. Would, a, would the stress test have guided the FPC to such a result starting at a 1% standard times resting place, which is where we were, until a few, uh, until a month or two ago. And the answer we came to it would probably not be enough to get us where we needed to go. The severity of the stress test scenarios is based on the FPC's risk tolerance. We have judged that the UK banking system should be resilient to shocks that pushed key economic and financial variables into the neighborhood of the first percentile of their historic distributions, a one in 100 shock so that they are very severe. When risks are around a standard level, that is near the middle of distribution, that implies a scenario that in a number of dimensions, for example, the rise in UK unemployment, the fall in UK residential real estate prices, the drop in global GDP, is more severe than the global financial crisis. The scenarios get more severe as risks rise and less severe as they fall. This is done in two different ways. First, key economic variables are shocked to the same 1% level as the business cycle evolves, so that a scenario-based rise in the unemployment rate increases as the rate itself declines in an expansion. And a similar pattern is applied to other cyclical variables. But the FPC also assesses the state of the financial cycle to judge whether the shock to those business cycle variables is likely to be larger or smaller than a straight reading might imply. For example, unusually high levels of household or corporate leverage or bank reliance on short-term funding would tend to exacerbate a shock. In 2019, we judged that high credit growth and rising leverage in the Chinese economy and among US businesses implied that downside risks were unusually large, so we increased the size and duration of the global recession in our 2019 scenario. Critically, this type of risk assessment is not mechanical, but requires policy judgment based on a variety of indicators. Bank staff estimated a hypothetical, severely adverse scenario that could have been employed in 2007 using the process I just described. They started with a level of key variables at the end of 2006 
shock them to around their 1% risk tolerance of the committee. They adjusted the stress levels to approximate how the FPC might have responded in a world where the risk environment had become elevated. The scenario they generated included a drop in UK GDP of about one, one percentage point larger than the global financial crisis. Applying this scenario to 2017 balance sheets yielded an implied CCYB of about three and three quarters percent. So that's just in the range of the three and a half to five percent. I said we, we thought that the uh, UK economy would have required, UK banking system required. It's worth uh, recognizing that post-crisis reforms like central clearing and better margining for derivatives, limits on household indebtedness likely have substantially dampened some of the loss amplifying amplifiers at work in the global financial crisis. And those reforms, along with the more proactive provisioning under IFRS 9, imply that the same elevated risk environment might not map to the same severity of stress, capital losses, and implied CCYB today. But as this example suggests, the translation of the more severe scenario into sufficiently greater capital is by no means automatic. In the simulation I just talked about, the stress, a stress capital, the, the, a more severe shock than the global financial crisis produced a stress capital near the lower end of the range of estimates of the capital required for banks to keep lending through the GFC. Indeed, a larger shock need not translate into greater stress capital losses at all because that also depends on what's happening to bank portfolios. Nellie Lang and I looked at US stress, uh, US stress test capital losses and we saw little change in the stress test capital buffer for the GSIBs through 2018 and a material decline in that buffer in 2019 despite more stressful scenarios. Apparently, the underlying improvements in the quality of the portfolios, in part as troubled legacy loans were worked off, overwhelmed the effect of more severe scenarios. In my examination of UK stress test results, I did find that stress test capital losses had risen each year largely reflecting the increasingly severe global shock we applied. Still going forward, I think the FPC will need to pay close attention to the relationship of stress test severity and the implied hit to capital. As the FPC considered the 35 to 5% CCYB that would have been required prior to the crisis, we could see that it would have been very difficult to get there starting at a 1% uh, point in standard times. The development of financial risks in the 2000s was highly nonlinear, with risks rising very sharply in the few years just before the crisis. Even as late as 2004, only about 40% of a set of core indicators we referenced were in a zone that suggested elevated risks. Moreover, because the changes in the CCYB have a one-year implementation period, we would have needed to get, to, we would needed to have set a CCYB north of 3% by the end of 2006. And that would have been especially difficult in the face of the FPC's stated intention to raise the CCYB gradually. That's because late, large changes, requirements to raise a good deal of capital in a short time can have outsized effects on the cost of capital. Meeting capital needs by slowing distributions is probably less expensive and disruptive. In addition, the stress test process uh, itself takes considerable time. We settle on a stress test scenario and publish it by the end of the first quarter. That's what we'll be doing over the next few weeks in London. The results come in by the end of Q3 and we're published in Q4 with the increase in the CCYB effective in Q4 one year later. So it takes quite a bit of time to get this done. And we concluded from all this that starting from 1% CCYB in standard times, we risk falling behind the curve should risk rise to elevated levels. A resting place in the region of 2% greatly increases the odds on getting to the right level at the right time, but it by no means guarantees it. 
If the committee had begun to recognize the emerging high-risk environment in 2004, it would have needed to require a series of material increases in the CCYB to get it within the range I discussed earlier by the end of 2007. Now, we've moved in half-point increments. I know some countries move in quarter-point increments, but it would make it even harder to get there. One can envision considerable resistance to sizable increases in capital requirements when loan losses are low and the financial environment looks benign. Stress tests could be very helpful in that regard if there are ways of helping scenarios and implied capital evolve more quickly as the risk environment move from standard to material to elevated. And my challenge to you is to find ways that the concerns, I'm sorry, that the concerns, uh, to find ways that stress tests stress tests can better take account of nonlinearities in the cycle and lags in the process to help policymakers raise their countercyclical capital buffers soon enough and high enough when the risk environment is rising. All right, so on to the second topic, stress tests and releasing the countercyclical capital buffer. Those, non those nonlinearities and lags could pose an even greater challenge to stress testing after risk crystallized <coughs> and the FPC decides to release the buffer. The reason to raise the buffer is to increase the amount of capital that can be safely released in a downturn to support continued lending. The FPC has emphasized that buffers are there to be used after a shock. The CCYB is a particularly attractive buffer in that regard since banks will be able to utilize the capital released by a cut in the CCYB without incurring distribution uh, restrictions. Concerns about those restrictions, say as banks run into the capital conservation buffer, might make them reluctant to lend so they can hold down the denominator of their capital requirements. Stress tests will support the release of the countercyclical buffer as risk crystallize because the scenario will become less severe the unemployment rate will rise less following an increase. House prices will fall less after they already decrease. Risk environments will be less threatening going forward when some of those risks have already materialized. But there are reasons to question whether the scenarios will keep up with the developments, and even if they do, whether they will fully support the release of the capital buffer. An examination of this issue for the U.S. that Nellie and I undertook raised some questions about how this might work out for the U.S. for the most important banks, the GSIBs. The issue we surfaced for the U.S. was that in the second year of a recession, concerns about breaching regulatory minimums in the stress test might induce banks to cut lending to avoid substantially curtailing dividends, exactly the outcome the tests were designed to avoid. This scenario might lag downsize shocks because downward adjustments in financial markets tend to be especially sharp when sentiment turns. Think about the dot-com bubble breaking in the 1990s, early 2000s, or house prices falling a decade ago. And as I already detailed, scenario design and stress testing take time. Situation could have changed dramatically by, time, by the time the results were public. Moreover, our actual experience with the capital consequences of changing scenarios and stress tests is limited on the upside and non-existent after shocks hit. We don't know how much the stress test implied capital buffer would be reduced as scenarios adapted after risk crystallize. Some countercyclical capital buffer releases may be preemptive, as was ours, the FPCs, after the Brexit referendum. In that circumstance, the risk did not materialize. The FPC began to raise the CCYB in line with the original pre-referendum intention a year after it had reduced it, and that was backed by the stress test results. That, was, that worked out fine. But one can also imagine situations in which the FPC cuts the CCYB in anticipation of or in the early stages of an actual recession and risk-off financial cycle. In those early stages, the macroprudential authorities may appropriately take aggressive risk, uh, an aggressive risk management approach 
to buffer setting when threats, threats to financial stability begin to materialize, seeing risks and costs of future credit tightening as greater than the cost of an unnecessarily, unnecessary release of the CCYB that could just be reversed. These are circumstances in which the scenario and implied capital might not fully validate the lower CCYB. The consequences of these circumstances might be the FPC publishing a stress test that, for example, implied, say, a 1% CCYB when the committee had determined that zero was more appropriate. Explaining an inconsistency between the stress test and the countercyclical buffer in these circumstances is a communications issue. For example, the FPC could say that the scenario hadn't caught up with the reality. The FPC was being preemptive to avoid really bad outcomes that would result uh, if a cutback in lending amplified recessionary tendencies. But the challenge is not just about explaining an inconsistency to the public or the parliament. Two other critical target audiences for a well-reasoned explanation of why cutting capital requirements just as the economy weakens and loan losses begin to mount are the microprudential regulators and market participants. Both may be concerned with the difficulty implied by not knowing just how serious the situation may become and concerned about how banks will fare if the slide deepens materially. Market participants need to have confidence about that the viability of their bank counterparties will be protected by adequate capital even as the situation worsens, so they will continue to supply the funds the banks need to continue to lend. Communications will need to address the fact that the shock is not, exact, not, li is not likely to be exactly congruent with previous stress test scenario designs. Now, we, the FPC, have prepared for these circumstances in several ways. As already noted, we have stress assistance to a very severe shock, one approximated by key financial and economic variables reaching the neighborhood of the first percentile of their historic values, a more depressed level in several dimensions than associated with the global financial crisis. In this way, we try to build confidence in our view that banks will have enough capital in standard or elevated risk environments to remain active and viable lenders with access to market sources of financing after a wide variety of very severe shocks. Building on that, the FBC has published analysis showing indeed serious situations that differ in key ways from the stress test scenarios are encompassed by those scenarios. That is because banks had enough capital in the stress test, they would also have more than adequate capital even these other adverse circumstances, and we've used this for disorderly Brexit to show the banks would have enough capital in a disorderly Brexit, or in a global, in a global, uh, trade, uh, global trade war, and we even showed that they would have enough capital if both of those things happen at the same time. When we released the countercyclical buffer in 2016, as markets adjusted after the Brexit referendum, we were able to demonstrate with the results of the 2015 stress test that banks would be resilient even to a very adverse outcome, a tail risk, which might conceivably flow from this event but hadn't been anticipated. Judgments like this require not only very stressful base scenario, but credible modeling of the effects of alternative adverse shocks to show they are encompassed by the base case. I've dwelt a bit on the interaction of the stress test and the release of the countercyclical capital buffer because I sense our focus as policymakers and as researchers has been more on detecting and building capital against rising risks than it has been managing capital requirements after the shock hits. Indeed, the Bank of England's Independent Evaluation Office also made this point and its evaluation of stress testing at the bank. Many of the issues are similar. What role can stress tests play in helping how policymakers both raise and lower capital requirements in a counter-cyclical manner, consistent with financial stability and preserving an adequate supply of credit? But the downslope of the economic and financial cycles can be especially precipitous and bumpy the double black diamonds of financial cycles. I wrote part of this while I was on ski holidays, you can tell. 
and financial stability will depend on sustaining the confidence of market participants. There are a variety of, variety of ways the stress test might be made more supportive of the capital cyclical capital buffer release. For example, the whole process might be fast-tracked, run more frequently, scenario design incorporate to some extent a prediction of the rapidly shifting risk environment. Here again, I think we would greatly benefit from modeling and insights that you researchers might have on how to make this happen. Now, the third point I wanted to make was about stress test transparency, market discipline, and bank risk management. And to some extent, we got into this a little bit in the second, in the second uh, presentation this morning, the second panel this morning. Earlier, I noted that informing the FPC CCYB decisions wasn't the only goal. They can help shape the behavior of private parties as they assess and manage risk, the banks and market participants supplying them funds in ways that are more supportive of financial stability. A key to that is the transparency of the tests. The behavior we were trying to change in that first stress test was fear and flight from banks. Our goal was to build public confidence in the banking system by determining how much capital banks would need to be viable, even if a very bad economic and financial system got much worse, and then to force the banks to get that capital from either private or public sources. One key to rebuilding confidence and restarting bank intermediation in the spring of 2009 obviously was having a public source of capital through TARP in the U.S., for those banks that had been effectively cut out of private markets to buy doubts about their viability. But another was to apply very severe stresses and also to be very open about those stresses and how they affected the capital of individual institutions. Only in that way could the public reach the judgment that all banks were being held to very high standards for building resilience even in the midst of a severe crisis Transparency was required for credibility. A continuing high level of transparency has been important to the effectiveness of the stress tests after that. Transparency helps markets assess the strength of individual institutions and differentiate among them more accurately. Anticipation of market reactions to stress test results should discipline market behavior. In addition, stress test submissions give the micro-prudential authority insight into the quality of the risk management and capital planning of individual banks, which can then be used by supervisors to require upgrades or as inputs into decisions about Pillar 2 capital requirements. In the U.S., transparency about these management evaluations help to pressure the banks into substantial improvements in their risk management, capital planning, and governance. Shortfalls relative to expectations were publicly called out, and if those short falls were serious enough, they could impinge on authorizations to distribute capital. The Federal Reserve has determined to stop the public evaluations in of risk management in favor of folding the results into a largely non-transparent supervisory process. Expert observers of U.S. banks have been concerned that this shift will reduce the involvement of boards of directors and slow further improvements in risk modeling and management. In the U.K., risk management standards have been subject to supervisory interaction alone, but in 2019, the PRA published a high-level, albeit anonymized, overview of findings about the quality of bank risk management <coughs> based on an assessment of stress test submissions. In addition, the, FPC, the PRC has considered publishing its judgments about individual institutions. If the U.S. is any guide, such a step could accelerate banks' improvements in this important underpinning of financial stability. Finally, on transparency, the UK, in the U.K., the FPC has gone has gone to pains to be transparent about the impact of management actions in the results of its stress tests. As we said in our December 2019 financial stability report, banks' resilience relies in part on their ability in stress to cut dividends, 
employee variable remuneration, and coupon payments on additional Tier 1 instruments. Indeed, if banks had not cut their distribution sharply in the 2019 stress test, in aggregate they would not have met the capital hurdle rate we set. By reinforcing clear expectations about dividend and coupon conversion in the stress, stress tests can promote efficient pricing by the market. Facing a room full of stress test researchers, I can't resist finishing by putting out my agenda for where your work might take you, and I'm encouraged, as I said before, that quite a bit of this has been included in this conference. Obviously, from what I've discussed, a high priority would be to explore how stress tests can best inform the setting of capital buffers. A lot of information goes into our decisions on raising or lowering the countercyclical capital buffer, but stress test results as utilized in the UK are a valuable input and a cross-check on our actions. We have, a, we have a process that is sound in theory, but largely untested by substantial shifts in business and financial cycles. I'm looking forward to the session right after lunch, which I think covers this topic. Secondly, as I've said, transparency of stress test results is essential to their effectiveness in building confidence, improving market discipline, and giving banks incentives to hold adequate capital and model and manage risks well. We are often faced with decisions on how much more to publish about our own modeling and judgments as well as the results from the banks. As an economist, I'm usually on the side of arguing that more information makes markets perform better, makes, them, makes market pricing better, but market participants need the right context to interpret that information. And as we see in the context of stigma in the, at the discount window, information can adversely affect bank incentives to behave in a stabilizing manner. I know there's some literature on the effects of stress test transparency on market discipline and bank incentives, but I wonder whether as data points are added every year across a variety of jurisdictions, this also isn't an area in which economic researchers might have more to say on the optimal degree of transparency. My third point, stress tests are sometimes characterized as micro-prudential tools with a macro-prudential overlay in that they are on a bank-by-bank -bank basis with no explicit accounting for the effects of correlated positions or interconnections. In my view, this characterization undervalues the macroprudential aspects of these tests. The scenarios are adjusted by the stage of the economic and financial cycle. They're drawn from a history in which correlated positions and interdependencies influence these economic and financial cycles. The scenarios are adjusted to take account of current perceived risks, such as business leverage, and systemically important institutions are held to higher standards. These are all macroprudential. Moreover, staff at the Bank of England model the effects of correlations and interconnections using the data submitted by the banks and report those results back to the FPC. No doubt modeling of these feedback loops is still a work in progress and can be further improved, enhancing the macroprudential aspects of the tests. One method to explore would be running a two-stage stress test with the results of the initial submissions being used to modify the scenario to be used in the second stage. In fact, we are doing this in our biennial exploratory scenario this year, which covers bank liquidity shocks. So the banks are given a liquidity shock. They tell us how they're going to react, and we're going to feed that back to them to see how that affects market prices and structures. Perhaps, uh, and then my final and fourth uh, challenge, uh, perhaps the most profound challenge for stress testing is to extend it beyond the banking sector. The focus of session three tomorrow morning. The FPC regularly examines whether risks beyond banking need our attention or even our suggestions for extending the regulatory perimeter. And these efforts are backed by extensive staff research and modeling. For example, in our 2018 review of non-bank leverage, we looked at risks from hedge funds using bank staff research to identify the potential for rapid shifts in demands for liquidity. 
The FPC is currently awaiting a joint review by the bank and the FCA, the conduct authority, on the financial stability risks posed by liquidity mismatch in open-ended funds. And bank staff have been at the frontier and system-wide stress test simulations. Some of this is now being used by the FSB. Still, my answer to the question you get all the time of what keeps me awake at night is drawn from my experience of not seeing the buildup of risk prior to the global financial crisis. So much of that risk involved risky and opaque intermediation away from banks. There will be many rewards from improving our modeling of non-bank risk, including identifying tools required for financial stability and a better night's sleep for me. What greater incentives could you want? So thank you. So we have some time for questions and answers, or comments, or reactions, critical or supportive, anywhere. All right, people have been silenced or asleep after lunch. All right. Yep. <clears throat> Maybe I can try to break the ice. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, I was very interested about uh, I mean the, the study you did uh, at the Bank of England on um, how much a CCYB would have prevented a major uh, deleveraging in, in the financial crisis. I was just wondering whether you can tell us a bit more on the assumptions you used to, to um, estimate that in the sense that uh, um, not everybody believes that uh, current buffers are yes. not usable. So this is to I, I, I actually very, this is to get to the very three. much uh, on, yeah. on your line of thinking, but uh, right, right. how did you convince the, uh, the <laughs> ones that uh, have well, doubts about the usability, yeah. non-usability of current buffers? Yeah. So this is to get the three and a half to five before the crisis, is that what you're, you're thinking about? Yes. Okay. and. Uh, and what are the assumptions? Because you say, you know, the banks will deleverage more the closer they get to minimum requirements. Yeah. But minimum requirements are made also buffers that in principle could be usable, so the banks could, could breach. Right. So not everybody believes on this deleveraging story when banks will get closer to those buffers. I do believe about that, but you have to have, <laughs> yeah. you have to have some assumption on how banks deleverage uh, getting closer to the requirements right. and what are the consequences of uh, uh, right. breaching the buffers, the right. existing buffers that in principle could be. Well, breached. I mean, I think what's really, really neat about the CCYB is that once you release it, that capital is usable without getting close to any restrictions. Now. You don't know how the market and the banks will react. We haven't been there. Um, so it could be they would still worry that even as they went through usable capital buffers, uh, what had been capital buffers, they would still encounter some market resistance or some micro prudential resistance. Um, we just don't have experience with that. But I do think what's key here is getting it high enough beforehand, right? And that's what drove us from the one to the 2% resting place, because we'd never get to three. It would be very, very hard to get up to three uh, or three and a half before a crisis starting at one. So I think you've got to get it high enough such that you can show people that you've applied as really, really severe stress and the banks still have enough, cap enough capital, certainly more capital than they had in 2007, a lot more capital, and therefore could continue to access funding and make, and make loans. You know, as I, as I, just to repeat, when we, do, we haven't been through that process, we don't know what will happen, but there must be some level you can get to that gives people enough reassurance, both the microprudential regulators and the, um, and, and the markets. Um, uh, uh, there's no magic formula 
but um, I think all we can do is try. I mean, that's the whole point here, right, is to get the capital high enough that it can be, banks can use it to make loans and aren't amplifying the cycle. That's the whole point of what we're trying to do. Yes. Hey, hey, thanks very much for, for the presentation and especially on the point on how to think about releasing the capital. Indeed, it's something I'm sure we need to work more on. Uh, the question I had is a bit the interlinkage of the result of the stress test on the one hand for CCYB, as you mentioned, but on the other hand on what we call here in Europe P2G, P2 guidance, which is also not triggering any MDA if you, if you use it. So how in an institution like yours where you do have both sides, the macroprudential and microprudential, how you would why would you prefer a CCYB compared to a guidance? Because in the end, it's not triggering any MDA if you use it. I mean, can you elaborate a bit more on the choice? Because in the end, it's additional capital above what is required. So I don't know enough about the guidance, really. What I like about the CCYB is it's very transparent and open. It's there. And there, we're releasing X billion sterling of capital that the banks can use to make loans. The governor, after we did this in 2016, translated that into hundreds of billions of loans. I was a little uncomfortable with making that translation, but it, you know, it's a, it was a legitimate point. And I don't, I don't know how open guidance is or how transparent. I also like the fact that the CCYB, as opposed, I think, the guidance and certainly the pillar two kinds of things, the transparency helps the accountability of the macro prudential regulators. So we need to go in front of parliament and say why we raised it, why we lowered it, here's how we support it. This is really important in a democracy to be able to do that. So I, I, I like the transparency of the CCYB. Uh, from a number of from a number of dimensions. So, uh, how how do you? I, first of all, thanks a lot. Very interesting uh, presentation. I was very interested in all of the discussion in relation to the CCYB, and I have a question also on that. How do you foresee the interaction of stress tests and the release phase uh, of the CCYB? And don't you see a tension with the transparency? given that one of the presenters before, uh, one of the discussants was also mentioning that this is a bit black box, which would, wouldn't uh, undermine a bit the transparency. Well, so that was one of my concerns, that we would release the buffer from two down to zero, let's say, but the stress test would imply one, because the scenarios, we were doing it a little bit in a, um, in a, in a proactive way, anticipating things, uh, that what, uh, so I, I do think it's an issue, and as I say, Nellie Lang and I, in thinking about the U.S. stress test, came up with, we did a numerical example of go through year one, now try year two, and what's going to happen there. And even though the rise in the unemployment rate would be less, the decline in property prices, it was hard to imagine that at least for the GSIBs, for the largest banks, that, this, that the stress test wouldn't put them right, at, right near the hurdle rate, maybe for some of them below it. Um, so I think it's an issue how to, how to figure that out. That's, I left that as a challenge for you. Uh, but I also think it's something we need to think about. And one response, and a response to tell the truth I got from uh, colleagues at the bank, at least one colleague, was, well, you just explain it's a communication issue. But, we're talking about confidence and market confidence. Um, so I, th I do think it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem, especially since the release tends to be sharper. I mean, if we release from two, we go from two to zero. If we thought it was a serious enough situation, we go up in halves and down in, in holes. Um, so how to keep the stress test up with that, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. That was, as I say, that was my, ch what, what was a challenge for, for researchers. Uh, but it's something we need to think about. And uh, as I say, we spent more, more energy thinking about how were we going to get it high enough and very little energy about how we were going to get it down.
And maybe we need to turn to that. Two questions. First, how precisely do you want to announce the conditions under which the CCYB will be released? And the second question, how do you think of macroprudential policy and monetary policy jointly? Um, so on, on the first one, I don't think we can be precise. I don't think we can say under this specific situations we would release it. Uh, we have said in most of our experience that the FPC has been Brexit related, as you can imagine. Um, and we've said in the last several um, announcements we've made over the last year or so is that we're prepared to go either way and everybody knows what that means is in a disorderly Brexit, we'd probably release it. But I don't, you need, you'll need to look at a whole variety of indicators and um, a sense of what's going on and what might go on, particularly if you're releasing in, in a uh, forward-looking way to figure out exactly the circumstances under which you'd release it. I think you'd want to see uh, changes in financial market prices that suggested tough times were coming. There was a risk-off situation. You'd want to see things that foreshadowed a recession that might put pressure on banks. But we haven't said, and I don't, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. Again, like in response, to, we've paid more attention to the indicators you'd look at as risks were building, and I think less attention to when you should when you should release it. We have a bunch of indicators, what we call core indicators. We see a chart of those every time we come together, how many are in what part of their distributions, whether risks seem to be rising or falling. But um, it's, not, it's, not gonna be, it's not gonna be mechanical. On the macro pro and monetary policy, um, I guess my, my strong preference is that uh, we have strong macroprudential tools so that we don't need to rely on monetary policy to take account of financial stability issues. Because every time monetary policy does that, say in a risk buildup situation, tightens up, it's going to miss its inflation target. That's, you're deliberately steering away or taking longer to get up, back up to your 2% target. Every time you do that, fewer people will be, have jobs than would otherwise have. You'll, be miss, you'll miss your macroeconomic targets, and I'd prefer not to do that. I think this, the UK is in better shape than most jurisdictions for making monetary policy the last line of defense for financial stability. It's in better shape than the US. So the US has no housing tools. It has housing tools, but they're aimed at consumer protection, things like that. They're not aimed at macro prudential uh, authority. We have our insurance companies are state regulated, not federal, federally regulated. Um, so I think we're, the US is badly lagging in this case, and we need to build these tools up. So a little bit of uh, advertisement here. Uh, Brookings Institution, my other hat, along with uh, University of Chicago Booth Business School, Anil Kashyap, who's a colleague on the FPC, has put together a um, task force on financial stability for the US. And we're in the process of, over this year, coming up with recommendations, both for the regulators and for the legislatures, about how to strengthen the tools, the macroprudential tools for the US. Um, right now, I don't think that would have a very, very clear audience, but maybe it will in the future. But I think it's a problem in the US. And obviously, it's a problem in, in, in the Euro area, too, because you're macro and micro prudential tools are scattered among all those different authorities and coordinating them and putting them in play with uh, taking the pressure off monetary policy is going to be very, very difficult. And I hope that 
that uh, uh, Christine Lagarde has announced a framework review for the EU or for the euro area, just as the Fed is. And I would, I would hope, I don't know, but I would hope that the interaction of monetary policy and financial stability and how to reduce potential conflicts there would be part of that framework review. All right. Thank you.